Hello there and welcome back to the studio. Today the first thing I'm going to do is get a little bit of burnt umber into a size 2 flat bristle brush, a little bit of odorless mineral spirits, and I'm just going to try to mix up a consistency of which I can draw with. In the meantime, here is an image of the painting that we are going to create. In today's episode, remember it is a paint-along episode, so I really do encourage you to draw or paint along with me. We are going to be creating a painting of a, a master study of an, another John William Waterhouse. So while I'm putting in my first few marks here, so right now this is just to kind of indicate you know, the furthest extremity above that I want the head to fit. But here is an image of the original John William Waterhouse painting along with the name of it. I believe this is a uh, Waterhouse study. So this is a study that he made for a larger painting. Now I will not be linking the image, okay? Uh, I just don't, I don't feel like getting demonetized. That's what happened the last few times I actually linked the uh, the resource where I got the image of the painting. So with a quick Google search of the name that I showed you for the painting, you should be able to find it rather simply. Okay, so now we have a very simple uh, kind of uh, indication of where the head is going to fit and as you probably noticed by now the uh, camera setup is a little bit different you seen you have seen a similar setup to this before uh, when I was uploading daily this is a setup that allows you to see the canvas with much less distortion and audio wise you may be hearing my uh, AC unit a little bit more than normal but this does use a much more sensitive microphone so in theory at least it should sound a little bit more crisp I don't know so now I have another a few other indications for compositional elements so the, the hair going off the corner over here and then down over here and then all through over here now the important thing right now is just to, you know, keep the shapes rather workable. Notice how I'm holding the brush all the way, um, you know, the furthest distance back. So one little mark there for where the eye may fit. And another one down here for the nose. Now remember the purpose of this master study is to observe a master painting and to create a master study of it. The purpose is not to copy it. Okay, remember, if I were to try to copy this painting perfectly, all I would do is just take a photograph and print the photograph directly onto the canvas, call it a day, and that's not what I want to do. So now we're going to put a little indicator for the back side of the eye. It could fit a little further back. So now we're quickly just looking at the contour. No need for details, okay? If you're drawing or painting along with me, just forget about the details. They're useless at this point. Okay, so now we have a basic indication for where all the proportions are going to fit. Maybe just a little angle here. So the idea is simple straight lines and angles, okay? Straight lines really do help you construct. And it's something you see that is very prevalent even in these um, the master studies of so long ago. You know, you can see right over here on the um, original painting the usage of straight lines and angles. I'm just trying to map out the contour. Let's go ahead and start to fill in some of the dark for the hair. And I'm working over top of uh, oil tone. This is a color, I believe it's, uh, this is very similar to the burnt umber tone that I usually use, but it's in fact just a bunch of colors that I combined when I was cleaning off my palette one day to give me that kind of like a neutral brown color. 
So a little bit of the dark for the eye. Doesn't need to be perfect. And there's the tear duct. Don't need any details, okay? This isn't a detail, this is just the top of the, the eye. The tear duct, these are indicators for where the shapes are going to fit in relation to one another in space. All of this is really spatial reasoning. You're reasoning with the space on the canvas to create a coherent image, a, an image that conveys a sense of depth, sense of space. Now I'm going to get a clean and dry bristle brush that's mildly worn out, ideally, to help the paint push around. I'm really thinking about the main triangle, which in this case really isn't much of a triangle. It's the point from here to here, okay? And I'm doing my best to sit back and remember, as I said before, um, you know, if you're drawing or painting along with me, I really encourage you to do so. Get, you know, get a sketchbook. There's the photo reference. I gave you the name of the painting. You can easily look it up. Um, in any case, every time I sit back, uh, I encourage you to sit back along with me. And this is really going to be the, you know, the part where, you know, you want to lay down the scaffolding, so to speak, for where everything is going to fit. So let's see here, the corner of the nose comes down to here. Um, in my own work, um, you know, whenever I do a larger studio paintings, if you'd like to see my, um, my paintings, um, I, like in terms of, uh, you know, studio paintings and things like that off YouTube, that's what I mean by that, um, you can easily find my work on Instagram. This is the kind of the approach that I've been preferring these days, uh, drawing like the best kind of uh, simplistic contours possible. Though when I'm working on my own studio work, I'm much, much slower than this. All right, so I'm going to add a little bit of odorless mineral spirits onto this brush just to push this shape over a little bit. Might look kind of kind of funky there, but that's okay. The odorless mineral spirits will uh, do its thing and kind of evaporate into the air. So I'm just pushing the contour down a little bit more. It looks like Waterhouse, uh, John William Waterhouse used a type of burnt umber drawing as well. You can kind of see it, you know, in his sketches and some of his um, unfinished works. Which is really nice to see. I really, um, you know, enjoy seeing an artist's process especially an artist such as, uh, you know, John William Waterhouse. Right now I'm just uh, unifying the tone, the mineral spirits, just so I can have even more uh, control over the mark making in this stage. So if if I can convey where the mouse the mouth the mouse where the mouth is going to fit with just a few brush strokes at this stage, that's really the best thing I can do right now for the mouth. You know, later on it's just going to be a matter of just fitting all the shapes, all the other shapes over top. And, and in a way, I think, um, you know, drawing like this has a little bit less of an awkward stage. 
you know, this is this is more akin to a um, an underpainting, really, than um, you know, alla prima. So this whole study is going to be completed, you know, all in one layer. So technically, it is alla prima, but we're treating it like you know, like an underpainting that we're going to go over top of. That's the idea. And so remember, um, there's always a bit of fear in the start of a portrait, and that's just, that's normal, okay? So if you feel a little bit timid or, uh, you know, intimidated at the start, Especially, you know, this early on, it hasn't even been 15 minutes. You know, that can really be intimidating. But just know that that's natural, you know, that fear. Just remember in life, no matter what you do, there's always going to be people out there that for some reason take pleasure in trying to bring you or others down. And that's just really sad. You know, that's sad on the people that feel like they feel better about themselves by bringing others down. And I, I really hope the best for them. You know, if anyone ever tries to bring you down in your own work, and it makes you fearful of your own work, then, you know, those people really don't matter. And they just, you know, they need help. Just because they think that making others, trying to bring others down will elevate themselves and that's just sad. So my advice to you in terms of, you know, the fear of critics or the fear of, you know, looking bad or something with your own artwork, you know, just know that it's natural. It's always there. You know, don't, don't be upset at others for trying to bring you down. Don't get angry at them. Remember, Hate only fuels hate. It's an endless cycle. It's an endless cycle. So what I'm doing is I'm facilitating this little dark shape, you know, talk about awkward stage, right? That looks pretty awkward there. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is just uh, get the dark for the iris in the relative correct space. You know, I could care less about the details surrounding it. But I'm more or less focused on that shape. And I know that the uh, mineral spirits will do its thing, right? It'll just kind of evaporate into the air. And as I've said before, uh, this is very similar to charcoal. This handles almost the same as, um, you know, working with vine charcoal or something like that. So if you really want to get into painting, uh, oil painting, you know, in this kind of way, I would definitely recommend uh, starting off, you know, getting as much experience as you can with charcoal. And this is really where most of the problem solving is at in terms of drawing. Just the simple shapes of light and dark. And I'm not going to get it perfect, okay? You know, it's not going to be 100% perfect. But the idea is to approach it in a kind of coherent manner so that when we get into the color, you now we can continue to build the specificity onto this.
And I'm not entirely sure if I want to put in all this stuff around here, surrounding the hair. I don't think that, um, you know, in his final painting, you know, since I said uh, this was a study that John William Waterhouse did for a larger painting, I don't think he actually incorporated this exact thing in the final painting. I don't really know. Alright, I think that's uh, that's pretty much enough for the uh, the basic underlying drawing. I mean, I could put more you know stuff here to pinpoint exactly where you know the hair fits all into here and whatever. Let's let it be a sketch. Okay, so now I'm gonna get some other brushes. We're gonna start to talk about flesh tones. So I'm going to start off with the flake white, yellow ochre, the nickel yellow, flake white. And if you would like to know exactly what materials I'm using, you can scroll down to the description box down below. They will all be typed up. I've been forgetting to put this yellow, so I'm going to do my best to remember after uh, this filming to put that in. Alright, but in any case, the flesh tones, okay, the flake white, and see this, more of this kind of less of this and a tiny bit of red and a, a touch of the um, alizarin permanent and I'm gonna look for the light so I tend to start off with the light with the flesh tones these days you know the question of shape has been mostly answered already and I'm gonna let the burnt umber okay the burnt umber mix a little bit of titanium white there. So the burnt umber mix with what, what we're uh, creating on the palette. It's okay. Although ideally, ideally I don't want too much of it. I'm just being lazy. Don't be lazy like me. All right, so I just took it off with the palette knife. So talk about flesh tones, okay? So now we're gonna be looking for a kind of orangey, warm flesh tone and the main thing to say right now is I'm not using any mineral spirits absolutely none because we want the paint to be very very thick very rich in color and you just kind of lose that if you use too much medium right away when I do use medium I'll tell you when and why I'm using it I tell you though I really like the way the nickel yellow combines with the cadmium red medium Creates a nice kind of uh, orangey, warm tone. So there we go, getting more of the lights. Then it's going to start to get a little darker around here. But I'm going to use the light of the uh, canvas, the tone of the canvas to help me out with that. Or I guess I should say the dark. Now a little bit of titanium white. Now remember titanium white um, and flake white are used for two different kinds of things. So they're both white colors. Um, flake white has this property as you've seen of which allows you to use more of it without raising the value too much therefore allowing you to have a thicker consistency of paint that's all I mean there are other reasons for using flake white too but I mean that's why I'm using it so a little bit more pink down to here so the start can be kind of segmented you know the start of the um, let me see if I can turn down the uh, there you go so the start of the uh, color when you put in the color can be a little bit of uh, intimidating you know like you're all of a sudden you're just in this whole new world endless possibilities here a little bit more of the cadmium sorry not the cadmium the alizarin permanent Lizard and Crimson Permanent. Get a little bit of a darker tone. More flake white. So what was I saying? Um, 
so I'm kind of doing like three things at once. I'm painting, I'm talking, and then I'm also thinking of what to talk about. So um, just bear with me here. So the introduction of color into your painting can send you into a different mindset. And um, the important thing is to always relate shapes to one another. So now I switched brushes, if you notice. I mean, they're kind of the same brushes. They look the same, but they are different brushes. So the, um, you know, there's a transition in your thinking when you start to incorporate color, especially if you're, you're relatively new to painting, you know, if the idea of flesh tone scares you. I would suggest doing this a lot, um, mixing up color value webs. That's what I'd like to call them. You can call them whatever you want. But color value webs, um, so basically as you go down the, uh, the value scale, you still want flesh tone, but you know you can change the relative value of the flesh tone. So it's getting darker as it goes over here. And then on to the right, we can make it either warmer or cooler, uh, still following our values from light to dark. So right now with this darker uh, brush, I'm trying to get the um, you know the effect of these half tones, a little bit more pink, and still, like I said, no medium. Forget it, none at all. This is how you get the most rich colors you possibly could, uh, that you possibly can, uh, forgive my English there, the, the best color you can get, the richest color, is the color right out of the tube, mixed with the other colors right out of the tube without the influence of medium. A medium is kind of like superpower for, um, for oil paint. A medium will allow oil paint to do something different than what it was meant to do straight out of the tube. That's why we use medium, among other things. That's mostly why we use medium. So, for instance, when I want to add, you know, like eyelashes or smaller shapes, I will thin out the paint because the thinner paint will stick onto the thicker paint. So that changes the way that the paint handles. Again, medium is like a superpower for oil paint. But you don't always want to use your superpower, okay? Use your superpowers sparingly. Use them to the best of your advantage. But what I'm doing right now really is looking for the half tones. You know, I'm seeking out the half tones because, you know, if I can get a, a sense of the underlying structure, the tonality, and I can get the uh, the forms to read. I'm in a pretty good place to just slap on the features and the smaller shapes, and then just call it done. You know, all of the work really is in the midtones. I think. Now in terms of paint handling, you really want to be able to organize your brushes. The more you can organize your brushes, the less time you have to spend cleaning them. On a practical note, you don't want to spend too much time cleaning brushes because once you start to introduce uh, the uh, thinners, the odorless mineral spirits and all that stuff into your color, you're going to be fighting the uh, you know, the, the mineral spirits. And I, in the past, okay, I, I would use, I probably would have already dipped into my, my mediums and, and whatnot. Um, but you know, after doing a lot of these master studies and really looking closely at them, even though they're just pictures, they, I really did get this sense of, you know, how about try using less medium? 
until eventually, you know, in my studio work, I would just take the medium off my palette, you know, that I like to hold my palette when I'm working in the studio. You know, as, as you used to see me in the daily Upari, I would always hold the palette. You know, I'm still doing that every day, just off camera now. But in any case, I, I went so far as to even take it off the palette f for even like the first two layers, really. And ideally, you want to use uh, less medium in the beginning and then gradually add more and more medium. But what I found is that if you use too much medium early on, like in maybe the first two layers, the colors will start to fade, especially the darks. And like the worst thing in the world really for a painter is to have the darks fade on them. You really want to convey a sense of dark in order to convey a sense of light. You know, you can't have light without dark unless you're using a laser pointer. And even then, I don't really know. Is, is that even a true statement? Um, if a laser pointer shines a light here, I'm just getting off topic. But I do think that's an exception. You know, you, someone can say you can't have light without dark, but a laser pointer shines a light and whatever. Off topic. Let's stick with the painting. So I'm going to put in the dark little um, accent for the cheekbone with a combination of the sap green and the alizarin because as I said before I think those two colors were kind of meant for each other. Call it an ugly color, call it whatever you will. I enjoy the way these colors look especially in the darker half tones on the flesh tones. And then even over here, I can start to put in some darker notes. And again, the details, the details are useless, okay, even at this stage. Just think of detail right now as decoration. You don't really need it. It's like a frame to a painting. You don't really need it unless you're trying to decorate the painting. All right, so now for the lips, I'm gonna focus on the areas surrounding the lips before getting too, too hung up on the actual lips themselves. You know, if you look at a lot of Velasquez, Rembrandt, Sargent, Peter Paul Rubens, Alma Tadema, our man right here, Waterhouse, you'll notice that the lips themselves, the lips, don't really have that much detail. Though I think that it's a little cooler in temperature, so sap green. A little bit of sap green, but in any case, the lips don't really have that much to them, and a lot of artists will move the mouth a lot. And by the mouth, I mean the lips, not the actual structure of the mouth, but the lips themselves tend to move a lot and that that's just because the lips are so much easier see I'm actually mixing up a cooler value color value web over here the lips are just much easier to move around but what really matters is this right here the structure surrounding the lips that's gold for you right there if you can get yourself to think about the structure surrounding the feature and ignore the fact that it's a feature of the face you're, you're gonna you're going to improve in your drawing or your painting exponentially you will you, you just will that's the way it works So if you notice, the, the hue drops uh, a little bit, meaning it gets a little cooler around here. Um, and this is a very peculiar type of flesh tone, okay? So I'll, there is a little bit of sap green involved in it, okay? So the color, the cool color, should I say, 
that you use for the cooler dark flesh tones. Um, you can stick with sap green if you want. If you have Viridian, I think I used to actually use that in the past. But sap green is just kind of the way to go. It's not as it's not as chromatic. It's not as overbearing. Uh, whatever you do, don't use a thalo in here. You know, like thalo green or thalo blue. Just forget it. It's just it's gonna be way way too too jarring of a cool color. Though you could probably get away with it in some instances. I'm not saying you can't, but in general, a little bit of sap green mixed into the usual flesh tones that you have will go a long way, and just a little bit in that area. And then, of course, it's going to get cooler around here, okay? So check that out. I'm using even more of the sap green. And again, I really I hope that you're enjoying this camera view. It's a little bit more difficult for me, or should I say a lot more difficult for me, um, the camera is literally here. I'm literally like here, like right next to it. Um, it does take some getting used to for me, but you know, no one cares about that. As long as you're enjoying the camera shot without all of the distortion, I'm happy. So again, a little bit more of the sap green mixed into the cadmium red, yellow ochre, cadmium, sorry, um, nickel yellow mixtures in here. That's what'll do the trick for you. That's what's gonna get you those magical flesh tones. And uh, if you get to a point in painting where you just feel out the mixtures, that's a really, really good place to be. In fact, that's kind of where I'm at most of the time with my flesh tones. I get a lot of questions with flesh tones, so that's why I'm really, with today's episode, I'm really trying to address that. Um, a lot of it really is intuitive. A lot of it is really something that you just kind of feel your way. You know, like, like gears to a car, you know. Um, if you're taking a corner at some speed and you're driving, assuming a manual car, uh, you can kind of gauge what gear you need to be in to get the optimal, um, you know, rev range to your car or motorcycle or whatever kind of vehicle you use. And I know that's probably not the best analogy to use, but think of it like an instrument, okay? The colors are like, inst like keys to an instrument. In the beginning, you really have to memorize, you know, what song you're trying to play or whatever. Um, but after a while, I assume that a musician gets so used to their the keys on their, you know, like keys to a piano or something like that. A pianist will get so used to the keys on the piano that they don't really have to think about, you know, what button to press or what key to press. And I'm not a musician, okay? I'm not a musician, so... If I said something wrong about that, I'm sorry. I'm doing my best to create an analogy for you. Okay, I, I can only know so much, say so much, do so much. And all throughout here, I've been using the uh, halftone brush. Still no medium at all. None. I should probably put something in for the lips, so uh, let me get a different brush here. This is a synthetic brush. And I'm using it just because it's a smaller brush and it was near me, so that's why I'm using it. So Burnt Umber, Alizarin, Crimson Permanent, a tiny bit of the Nickel Yellow. And I'm gonna go for the top middle portion of the upper lip first. Okay, so there, there's, I guess that's where it fits. But I am missing another color, so 
Let's see here. Let's get a smaller brush again. It doesn't really matter what brush it is, to be honest. It's just it's a smaller brush. We're locating the top of the upper lip. I'm just trying to place it. Okay, so let's get that bur uh, burnt umber drawing color. And I'm just trying to place all of these shapes here. So I'm going to stand back. So there's a little bit of a cooler color there. I actually need to go get another brush. All right, so I got a different brush, a little bit of the um, ultramarine blue. Hopefully I press record, yep I did. So a little bit of the ultramarine blue, the nickel yellow, ivory black. Sorry, I'm shaking the, the whole setup there. Okay, let's place this shape. There we go, oops. I think that was a happy little accident there. I do like the way this blue uh, started to push the burnt umber around. Okay, now that we got that shape. So you'll see painters do this a lot, you know, get a color, push it all the way to the outside corner, and then go in and then do something like this, like right there. See, that's a painterly thing to do. Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna sit back again. Okay, so the drawing isn't perfect, but I think that we're starting to get some progress there with the mouth. So now back to that red color. So the cadmium red, the uh, lizard permanent, the nickel yellow. We want something that's kind of pinkish, yet a little bit orange. So, whenever you add a new bit of information into a painting, you usually go through the awkward stage again. And that's just natural, okay? Don't worry. It's just a natural thing. And the more paintings you do, the more, uh, the less the uh, awkward stage is gonna bother you. Unless you're making, unless you're filming videos on YouTube and then, you know, then that can be a whole different, a whole new can of worms. A whole new can of super worms. But that's not, you know, it's not what this is about. It's a little bit darker over here. A little more alizarin. Permanent. And this is why I said it was a good idea to put this dark in, like these shapes in first. See, I put too much there. It's okay if you want to finger paint to soften edges. Unless you're using flake white and you're eating something at the same time, which I wouldn't suggest. But I mean, I would li be lying if I said I never did that. So a little more of the cadmium red, the nickel yellow, brave brush it, just fearless. Fearless brushstroke there. Go. All right. So I think that it's starting to to read a little bit like a mouse. Though we're missing that little characteristic little jelly bean shape. I think that this model has. So let's get a little more. I mean that in the best possible way. there a little closer so now where's my brush once I find it here it is so the dark brush for this shape here 
and always, 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 always stand back. So I'm just gonna sit back. Let's look at these shapes. So now I'm gonna relate this dark to that one. I'm gonna go a little bit lighter. Okay, so that goes a little bit over. Something's up with the nose. I always mess something up with the nose or the chin. I think something's up. Maybe it's this, I don't know. Maybe it's the eye. Maybe that this eye needs to go down like over here a little bit. So let's do something that's never before been seen. We're gonna soften it via finger painting. See? Be brave. Always, always, always be brave. So a little bit of the burnt umber. So yeah, I think it needs to move down to here. And then while we're at it, let's get the color of the, um, the sclera. So the sclera, black and white, and some flesh tone. It's really all you need for that. So let's put that shape in there. Perhaps a little bit more than we need. That's okay. So now let's switch back to the brush that we used for this little dark blue shape. And we're going to use it for the color of the iris. Let's mix that over here. Burnt Umber. Ultramarine Blue. Sap Green. A little bit of Nickel Yellow just for some nuance. And whatever. Let's try this. Okay. And at first it's going to look wonky, at first it's going to look terrifying, but as long as the shape is in the correct place, relative correct place, relative is the key word, okay. Same brush, let's put in this half tone. There you go, little half tone there. No bother, just a simple little half tone. All right, now let's go ahead, switch to a darker brush. Darker brush, now let's put this shape in here. No problem at all. Now we're putting in the dark for the upper eyelid. That's why I said, man, the features are nothing. The features are nothing. Details are nothing. It's all about the big picture. If you can understand how to work with the big pictures, you don't have to spend a millennium on one eye and then have to move down to the nose or something like that, unless you want to. And I've worked that way before. Nothing wrong with that. You've seen me work like that before. Like I said, I tend to consider myself an explorer of methods an explorer of technique. You name it, I'll probably try it. In terms of painting technique, I don't mean anything else. Move that shape down. And of course the concavity of the eye socket. What about the concavity? I don't know. Mix this, mix this. A little bit of this and that. From the palette. And let's go ahead and put this dark shape here. And what I'm trying to convey really is that you don't have to be scared. Don't be scared of the painting, okay? You saw me literally use my finger to just rub out the eye, just decimated the eye. And then we just went right back into it. No problem. None at all. None. And now we're just putting a little more of a half tone here. So we're pretty much now in the, um, the small plane phase of this painting. Okay, small planes. OK. 
Okay. So I'm going to sit back again. So let's mix this, 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 and this, and see what we get. Cool. See, as long as the value is relatively in the right place, you know, the color more or less doesn't matter. You can get the color a little bit off as long as your understanding of your values is pretty good. You'll be fine. So a little bit more cadmium red into this mixture. See, that would have been too warm. So our friend right here, the sap green. Just to calm down the heat. Oh, that was, that was probably too much. There's a paper towel under here just to get some of the sap green out of there. Okay, what was I, what would I even mix that for? Okay, this, this shape. You ever do that? You ever mix up a color and then you forget what you mixed it for? My goodness. And it's not an age thing either. I'm 28. That just happens. Okay, so there we go. That's the the shape that I was after. Now, what am I going to do? I don't even know. I'm going to get a soft brush. Soften this little plane here. And I'm going to sit back, look for something else to change. Okay, how about we soften this too? So we mixed up the color that we wanted. But now, it's a matter of steering specific. Get the plane that you need, mix the planes up, and then get yourself a soft, clean and dry brush. You know, this is a pretty cheap brush, okay? Master's Touch, a round brush. You know, it could be anything. You can use a makeup brush if you want. Anything. You can soften the shapes. Now, materials-wise, this is where you want to invest the bristle brushes. This is a Robert Simmons. Uh, let's see if it focuses. Oh, whatever. It's a Robert Simmons brush. Bristle brush. Let's try that again. That's not fair. I should show you the brush. There you go. Robert Simmons, okay? I have the link in the description box down below. Let me just turn off the autofocus so I don't lose the shot. Okay. So I have links in the description box down below. Amazon affiliate links. So you can feel free to purchase the same the exact same type of brushes that I'm using. And the best part is if you use my link, Amazon will pay me a small amount in return. So if you do that, thanks again in advance. Anyway, uh, what was I talking about? So you really want to invest in the bristle brushes, okay? Especially if you're painting like this with oil paint. You want bristle brushes that can carry a lot of paint and not necessarily shovel the paint around. And as a bonus, um, you know, I'm not paid to say this, but these Robert Simmons bristle brushes, they last a pretty long time. Like these brushes I've, I've had for a while now. And they, they've been lasting quite nicely and they've been taking quite a lot of abuse. I mean, I've been painting. I paint every day, pretty much every day. It's kind of hard to get me out of the studio. You know, someone will tell me to socialize once in a while. But I just, I want to stay in the studio. Like, the studio is where I belong. Um, anyways, his brushes go through a lot. And they do really, really well. So take it as you will. I just think that they are a very good investment. So a little bit more of the nickel yellow. Now, if you go to my Instagram, I did do a master study off camera of this same image when I was trying to get, you know, practice for acrylics. Um, but I struggled a lot with the color, with acrylics in particular there, this area, okay. Um, so it's kind of a cool, warm flesh tone, which makes no sense. Um, but I've found just now that the uh, the nickel yellow 
is it quite important to mix into your half tones of your color value web just like this and it allows you it's allowing me to get these colors these very complex flesh tones with much more facility I just like the word facility I don't know Nelson Shanks would say that word a lot you know in his um, uh, you know the videos featuring him talking to a camera or something if you've never heard of Nelson Shanks, I would definitely look him up. He's like one of the best painters, one of the best painters that lived uh, r relatively recently. He passed away in 2015. But again, Nelson Shanks was really one of the major influences in my artistic career. In any case, um, so I'm really just trying to sculpt out these shapes, uh, make them much more specific now. So I'm going to get the synthetic brush again. It's kind of uh, trying to steer the paint towards more specificity. And uh, let's get a smaller brush back to the sclera color. No medium. Not yet. with a little bit of shadow that's showing on the iris there. Let's get the softening brush again. Soften over here. Okay, now let's get the middle tone brush. Let's just make it now the shadow brush, whatever. More burnt umber into this area of the palette. There's even a little note right here. Now that I put that shape in there, let's go ahead and get the softening brush. So, I don't think that I inserted the question of the day. Um, although I often always forget the question of the day, but uh, question of the day for the comment section. Let's fill up the comment section with positivity this time. So my question to you is what is your favorite art quote? Your favorite art quote. And I have to think about mine. It's probably going to come from Sargent. Yeah, it's going to come from Sargent. So I'm going to have to paraphrase this because I don't really remember it completely, like, word for word. But Sargent would say something like, uh, a portrait is a painting where there is something, just a little something wrong with the mouth. You know, that's one of my favorite art quotes. Okay, so now I was painting in the shadow shape and I, I forgot, so let's return to that. And um, I should reiterate, the purpose of these demonstrations, uh, you know, uh, other than creating a painting, is to create videos like this um, that you can watch and rewatch and paint along at your own pace, however you like, so that you can get more practice. I'm just trying to help you. You know, I know it's expensive. Art schools are expensive. 
Um, you know, if you can't, you know, if you can't afford to go to an atelier or formal art school or something like that, you know, I hope I can at least contribute something to, you know, to help you learn. Oh yeah, highlights. Uh, I'm gonna get what brush? Oh, whatever. Let's get another clean synthetic brush. And again, the mood today is relatively chill. Today is just a chill Thursday for me. So I'm filming this on Thursday, though it's going to be released on Saturday. It's a chill Thursday. I'll tell you a little bit my, about my day. Uh, I drove all the way to Wheaton um, in Maryland which is like 20 minutes away from me to get some, this kind of tea that's called boba tea. Never heard of it before, but it's Lucy's favorite tea. Um, and yeah, went to get boba tea and um, we shipped out the uh, painting that we sold. The last, or the, yeah, the first time I did the 40% off sale. So I'm gonna hold back on the 40% off I will do the 40% off deals once in a while. But anyway, I was just telling you about my day. Not to get caught up in too much stuff. Okay, so a little highlights there for the nose. Now, how about we return to the eye? So this dark brush here, a little bit of burnt umber. And the idea is to, um, you know, get the, the effect of the original painting, you know, the look of the original painting but with much less detail. So a single mark there. So now I'm gonna get uh, a little bit of this warm, cool color warm this cool neutral color here i don't know if this is damage to the canvas but i see some kind of lines here whatever they may be whatever let's put them in i'm gonna get the light brush let's see what's on this brush just to push this down that's why it helps to keep the brushes organized I'm just moving that shape down a little bit more. Let's give her less of a worried look. Now we're gonna get the uh, soft brush. Still no medium. That burnt umber color. Now she looks mad. Okay, so I'm going to raise this back up a little bit more. Okay. I think that's a little better. I think. Now is the time for medium. So... I am using Neo McGilpin Medium. It is right there. Neo McGilpin Medium. So let's uh, see if we can get this on camera. It's a gel like medium, what it does. Uh, it's a fast dryer, okay? Though um, a little bit goes a long way with Neo McGilpin. Same with many mediums, really. Um, it's a fast dryer, but if you use too much, it's kind of a slow dryer. So I think, don't quote me on that, but I think. So burnt umber. Lizard permanent, but I'm not using it for the fast drying property. I'm using it for the thinning the paint out property. Remember, a medium is a superpower. Medium gives your paint a superpower, meaning it can do something that it wasn't originally designed to do. So what it's doing for me is thinning out the paint a little bit more. The paint straight out of the tube wasn't designed to be this thin. Remember, use your superpowers sparingly. So I saved that 
uh, for the smaller little minutia. So here for the upper eyelid, just getting a thin little watery line here for our water house, just to get the little accent there. And um, while we have it, whoops, I bump into the camera. While we have it, I'm going to see if I can place yeah, place that anywhere else. So let me switch to a dark value. So this brush has no medium. And I'm going to put a shape in an area. Oh, no, no, not yet. I'm going to put a shape in an area that doesn't have medium directly below. All right, you're following along. So that has no medium. Back to the brush that has medium. Ivory black, ultramarine blue. So the idea is that the thinner paint will stick onto the thicker paint. Let's see, I'm gonna stand back. Okay. And there you go. So the thinner paint is sticking onto the thicker paint. Now, with the same brush, I'm going to kind of dry it off a little bit with just paper towel down here. I have a little bit of paper towel beneath the canvas. So it, it has a little bit of medium, but it doesn't have too much. So mixing this dark warm color with this. Now we're going to put in the um, tear duct. dark shape for the tear duct. And like I said, very sparingly. We're using this extremely sparingly. But now, we're able to paint directly wet onto wet. So dark underneath of the eye. See how very quickly we're adding on the minutia, the smaller shapes. That's why I said the smaller shapes and you know, the minutia is not really the most difficult part. You know, that right there is a matter of just putting a single brush stroke on, okay? That's nothing. The more difficult stuff was getting all of these large shapes to, to read. Now I'm going to get the, the shadow tone. Now I have to make a decision whether I want to put some of the dark for the hair. I think we're going to keep it kind of like a sketch, uh, to be honest. So, same brush, little, nope, nope, never mind. No, no medium, burnt umber, yellow ochre. A lizard, lizard permanent. So we're gonna keep this like a sketch. We're gonna make it look like a sketch because it is a sketch. It is a master study, not a master copy. A little burnt umber. I'm not gonna mess too much with trying to make it look exactly like the original. So down here, I'm gonna add the medium now. Medium, burnt umber. So we're creating a vignette right now. So a vignette is an area that is unfinished, that's left on purpose to complement the areas that are more finished in the painting. That's all. A little bit more medium. I really don't want to put the leaf, that little leaf looking thing. I don't really think it's that necessary for this study. So I'm just going to put in some more shapes here for the hair. And I think I'm going to stand back and then see if that's all I want to do. I mean, really, most of the work is there. Most of the work is already done. 
the rest of this would be just decorating it and I don't feel like it. No offense, I just don't feel like it. You know, this is the meat of everything. So we're going to soften. I'm going to sit back. Soften a little bit more over here. So this is kind of what I usually do near the end. It's just soften areas that I need to be softer. This definitely. And I've got a ton of new studio paintings that I'm working on, like a lot of studio painting. So if you would like to see, um, you know, my other paintings that I do, uh, links will be in the description box down below to my Instagram. That's where you can see. I uh, post there pretty much almost, almost every day. I forgot to post yesterday, but today I actually have to post. So I've been doing a lot more studio work and I want to, you know, put more time into my uh, Patreon, my patrons. If you would like to watch me paint live, uh, we are going to be painting, uh, we're going to be live streaming through, uh, for our patrons that are patrons of the live stream tier, through a, um, a streaming service, I, I don't know, Lu Lucy knows about that, but... Uh, yeah, so if you want to watch me paint live or, you know, send me images for critiques, we also have a mentoring tier. Um, so, yeah. Going to be spending much more time for my patrons on Patreon as well. But I hope that these longer videos have been helping you out as well. And I've really been trying to design these specifically for you. So you can watch and paint along with me. See how we're reducing the glare there? Just because, uh, yeah, I'm kind of making the brush stroke go in this direction. So a little tip to you. So my light is over there, somewhere over there, back here. Um, so if you want less glare on your painting, this is especially important if you're photographing your paintings. Um, you know, if you want less glare, try to apply the brush strokes or at least soften the brush strokes towards the direction of the light source in your studio whether that be a window electric lights or, or whatever see how it's helping reduce the glare a little bit Softening a little bit more there. All right, so I'm actually going to stand back. So I'm going to get off my chair and stand back. All right, so this area looks fine to me, though this is bothering me. So uh, the vignette is kind of important. It, it adds to the aesthetic of the painting. So very thin in a very thin fashion I'm just going to sketch a dark shape here for where her hair would fit and I'm using the medium now a little bit of medium though it's going to glare I think it was just bothering me to be honest to leave that you know, untouched. And now let's just throw in the background color. And again, this is just all for the design. So sap green and the um, the nickel yellow. This is all just for the design. So let's create our little vignette. Let's 
create those interesting looking brush strokes going up down up and down but in reality what i'm mixing this up for is just to eliminate this little outline here because that was just starting to bother me a little bit more medium And that was just, I don't know, for some reason it was bothering me. You can see it even in the um, in the original painting. See all those brush strokes you can see up there in the in the photo reference that we're using. You know, even Waterhouse himself probably either used turpentine or something to thin out the paint in the background. Which I think looks pretty neat, to be honest. I, I like that look. Maybe sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes even more than like a completely finished background. You know, I just like the way this looks. Yeah, it makes the painting feel very, uh, very alive, I think. So, if you're still watching at this point, let's insert our secret saying. So, our secret saying is going to be hashtag brave brush because that's what today's episode was. A lot of it was about brave brushing. Fearless. Be fearless. Don't worry about the critics. Don't worry about the cynics or whatever. Um, that is, uh, people that are cynical to you. No, don't worry about them. If anything, you know, hope for their well-being. Anyone that says anything negative towards you, towards your artwork, you know, they're really just, they're going through something. That's why they feel the need to try to bring others down. So instead of being angry at, at people like that, you know, just, just feel sorry for them. <laughs> That's all I can say, really. Hate is a contagious thing. Don't hate anyone. Be positive. Spread positivity. All right, enough of that. I think that's going to be about it for today's episode. Again, this was Paint Along style, so you have all of the footage presented for you. So you can feel free to draw or paint along with me and recreate the same image. No need for me to move the camera. The camera is as close to front and center as I can possibly get it, mind you. You can see that there's still a little bit of warping here. Um, if you know anything about DSLRs, uh, you know, the camera lenses in particular, let me know what kind of lenses I can use to not have so much distortion. I'm seeing here that's kind of warping this, but you know, the camera is front and center. It's just distorting a little bit. So if you know about camera lenses and you know some kind of lens that will minimize this distortion the camera is about a foot and a half away from the painting let me know i would really appreciate that i don't know why i'm still pointing out the distortion to you whatever drop the brush all right that being said i really hope that today's episode helps you out always remember in a world that can be so negative be the spark that ignites positivity among all of us i truly do hope that you have a wonderful day and i'll see you back on our next episode as I always forget to mention something, see, so much brave brushing, I just forget to mention things. So if you would like to support this channel even more, I have a Patreon account where I was talking about it earlier. I offer things such as, um, you know, mentoring. You send me images. I critique them in a coherent fashion, and I kind of guide you through your learning process. Uh, or if you would like to watch me paint in real time, like real, real time, like live streams, that's also offered on my Patreon uh, for my Patreon members. Um, so I have that and also I should say though this painting won't be on uh, it won't be at a discounted price at the current moment if you are interested in purchasing this painting or other oil paintings that you've seen on these uh, YouTube videos or that you've seen on my Instagram account I have paintings for sale on my website and my website has links to my Etsy account where you can feel free to purchase original oil paintings from me. I think that's all the announcements that I, I had to make at the end of this video. 
that being said, I truly hope you have a wonderful day. I'm not going to repeat the same stuff again. Just take care, and I'll see you again on the next episode.